If you're a beginner Clojure programmer, you may have run into cryptic errors and issues that leave you scratching your head and confused. In this video, I'm going to take you through some basic tools and techniques that Clojure programmers use to debug their code. This video isn't meant to be uh, a comprehensive guide, but if you're a complete beginner, it should at least get you off the ground and point you in the right direction. Let's set the stage by talking about my project. I'm building a set of REST APIs to query information about books. Currently, I have uh, just one API that returns the name of the book given its ID. As you can see, the entire app is about 50 lines in total at the moment. I'm using Ring to serve HTTP and Biddy for routing. At the slash book name slash ID route, I have a handler or I serve a handler that uh, takes in a book ID and uh, looks up the ID in, in the database and uh, returns the book name. As you can see, as you can see, it's all quite straightforward, but um, it has a problem. Let's start the app up in our terminal. I'm going to uh, browse to the route and make a get request to it, just like so. And you can see that in the response, the name is null. This clearly isn't right. We expect to see the name of the book here under the name field. Let's go back to the terminal and a mysterious stack trace has appeared here. So maybe these two are related. Let's take a look at the stack trace. It says null pointer exception, response map is nil. Uh, in the call stack down below, there's ring util servlet, update servlet response, invoke static, ring adapter jetty, then more jetty things and all the way at the bottom java lang thread run. None of these methods or packages in uh, this entire stack trace are in our application code. They all seem to be uh, in the libraries that we're using. The only bit of um, information that is obviously useful is maybe this, which is response map is nil. So this type of scenario right here is where I've observed a lot of beginners get stuck. Instead of using the REPL as a debugging tool, they might just stare at the code and uh, just try to reason about it and uh, come up with what might be going wrong that way. Or at the most, they might add a few print statements here and there in the code uh, and then restart the app right here in the terminal and then see what happens. So the, you know, looking at the code and just adding print statements, they can certainly help, but they're a very slow and uh, time consuming process. The REPL speeds up uh, this process greatly and it also unlocks other techniques and options for you to use. Now, because there isn't a lot of useful information in the stack trace, I'm going to disregard it for the time being. And instead, let's focus on using the REPL for debugging. Now to start debugging in the REPL, we need to have our entire app running in the REPL first. So I'm going to terminate the line run. And instead, we'll start the app up in the REPL. I'm going to load the file. And then I have a function here called restart server, which will start up the server. And if the server is already running, then calling it will stop the server and then restart it again. As you can see, I can do this very quickly. Uh, in fact, almost instantly. It's way faster than stopping and starting the app in the terminal. All right, now we can get started debugging in the REPL. As a first step, let's maybe just add a print statement. Let's add a print statement here. And if you're using a logging library, you can add a logging statement as well. Let's say, call the handler. And if we see this uh, in our REPL output, then we'll know that the handler was in fact called. So when we make a change, we need to load the file in the REPL. Uh, and in this case, because we changed the ring handler, we need to restart our server as well. Uh, in a later video, I'll maybe explain why we need to restart the server and show you how to make changes to your handlers uh, without having to restart anything at all. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to call the restart server function, which is anyway very cheap to do. Once we've done that, 
let's go back to our browser and reissue the request. I'll just refresh here. Now if we scroll up, we see that our uh, print message was uh, in fact printed to the REPL output. All right, so now that we know how to change our application to add print statements, uh, we can start digging deeper and uh, really tracing the source of this bug. Let's start by making sure our handler is being called with the correct parameters. So we've configured the route to match the ID, and then in our browser, the ID is being set to one. So the route params over here, um, according to the BIDI documentation, should be a map with the key ID mapped to the string one. We could verify this by putting a print statement here and printing out the route params, but we can do better than that. What I'm instead going to do is I'm going to capture the argument directly by adding an inline def. Inline defs are normally an anti-pattern in closure code, and you definitely shouldn't check code like, like this into um, mainline or into production. Uh, but for debugging, uh, they're very handy, just as long as you remove your defs uh, after you're finished with them. So what this def is actually going to do is it will bind this name to whatever the value of this parameter is uh, at runtime when this function is called. And because def creates global names, I'll be able to access this name in the REPL and we can play with it as I'm about to show you shortly. So again, we need to load the file. We need to restart the server. Server has been restarted. We reissue the request. There's no print statement because I got rid of the print of course, but now in this namespace, we have the name route params. So uh, as you can see, you can use def to capture arguments and uh, bring them into the REPL so you can play with them. Now that this is actually in the REPL, we can do some things with it. For example, we could look up the ID if we wanted to, or we could even pass route params itself around to other functions. For example, we could just call fetch book name with route params. That gives us um, this ring response with the status 200. And then in the body, we have name nil, which matches up with what we're seeing in the browser. In this case, because route params is really small, I'm just going to actually get rid of this and write out the whole thing by hand. And that gives us the same result. And now I can get rid of this inline def um, and we can reproduce the issue this way. If you have a more complex API that uh, accepts a bigger request or something that's harder to reproduce, then uh, this inline def technique might come in handy uh, to just grab the request so that you can uh, you know, pass it back to the handler and reproduce uh, the request that way. And of course, you can do this to any function. It doesn't have to be a ring handler. You could even add it here, for example. All right, so now that uh, we can reproduce the issue in the REPL, we don't even have to go to the browser, uh, let's really start digging deeper. I'm going to run uh, pieces of code in the REPL until I can uh, finally isolate and arrive at the source of the problem. So in the fetch book name handler, what are we doing? Uh, we take the route params, get the ID, convert it to an integer, then we, uh, we give the ID to this function, which uh, is supposed to give us the name. We construct a map out of it, and then we construct a ring response. So let's make sure this piece of code is working properly. In this case, all I have to do is copy it over into the REPL. and I'll substitute our route params into here. And this is giving us nil, which explains uh, why we're getting nil in the ring response uh, when we call the handler directly. Because this is a threading macro, I can actually comment things off of the end if I want to see the results of the intermediate steps. So if I evaluate this, that gives us one. 
So everything up until here is working properly. But as soon as we call this function, it's giving us nil, which is not what we expect. So let's dig deeper into this lookup book name function. I can call it directly in the REPL. And it gives us nil, which I think is not correct. Uh, we don't expect nil here, we expect the name. Let's look at what it's doing. It's running this uh, query using next.jdbc. The query itself is select from books where ID is this. That looks correct. Um, maybe the issue is that there's no data in the database. So let's make sure we have uh, some data in our database and I'm using Postgres. I'll connect to books, uh, which is the correct database. That's the same database that my app is connecting to. We've got a books table here. And we see that there are in fact uh, two entries in our books table and the ID one is mapped to the name foo. Uh, so the expected um, name should be foo, but it is giving us nil instead. So what else could be wrong? Well, so what this function is doing is it's running this query and then on the result, it's uh, calling this name keyword which is uh, what, what this is supposed to do is, if this is a map, it'll look up the keyword name in the map and then return the value. But what if this isn't actually returning a map? Let's verify uh, and just take a look at what it's actually returning. There are a couple of ways to do this. You can copy paste it into your REPL like what I'm doing, or you could also edit it in line and then load the file and then just call the function that way. So as you can see, what I've now done is I've removed the name uh, function call or uh, the keyword lookup. I'm just going to substitute our ID here. And would you look at that? This is in fact not a map, it's a vector of maps, which makes sense in this case, uh, because a query could return multiple rows. And so each map is a row and you could have many of them, hence it puts them all in a vector. So how do we fix this bug? Uh, I would say the quickest way to fix it would be to just take the first item out of this vector. And since we want name, we look up the name keyword in this map and we get foo, which is exactly what we expect. Let's make these changes uh, in our code. Again, I'm going to load. And now let's try calling our functions again and see uh, and make sure that they're all doing the right thing. This is giving us foo. And if I give it the number two or the ID two, it gives us bar, which matches up with what we have in our database. Seems good. Let's call our handler. This is giving us the name foo in the body. And this is putting the name bar in the body. Looks good, uh, but now to test it once and for all, uh, we'll have to restart the server and again issue the request in the browser. So let's do that. Excuse me. Server's been restarted. We can refresh this. And we get the name foo just like we expect. We can even test this with the other ID and we get the name bar. It looks like everything works now. So using the REPL, we, will, we were able to um, isolate and figure out the source of the bug and then fix it in the REPL and then test it again right there. Uh, there is still this issue of the stack trace. Um, we've already fixed the bug. So clearly this stack trace is uh, unrelated to the name being nil. Uh, there's probably some other source uh, that's causing the stack trace to be thrown. Uh, and I'll maybe dig deeper into that in a future video. I hope you found this introductory debugging video useful. In future videos, I hope to dive deeper into debugging concepts and focus more on specific techniques. Thanks for watching.